All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our April webinar uh, for Open for Anti-Racism. And we we're just thrilled to have Dr. Frank Harris III with us today. And uh, his topic is employing equity-minded and culturally affirming teaching and learning practices to advance institutional equity. And this is an area of expertise and scholar for uh, scholarship for Dr. Harris. Um, and I'm Una Daly from uh, the Community College Consortium for OER. And I'm here with my colleague, uh, James Glapa Grossklang, uh, College of the Canyons, who is the uh, co-principal investigator with me on the Open for Anti-Racism Project. We also hey, everybody. Glad everybody's yeah. here. Thank you, James. We're, we also have um, with us um, another, uh, an, uh, some other very important people on the Open for Anti-Racism um, project, and that is we've got our course developers here, uh, Joy Shoemate from uh, College of the Canyons, uh, Kim Gruy from the Northern Virginia Community College System, uh, and we also have our uh, coaches here uh, for our peer groups. Um, which are for our 17 uh, faculty who are actually in this cohort. And I, I'm not gonna introduce them right this moment um, because I'm sorry, I don't have uh, their names handy here, but um, James, do you remember our, 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 all of our coaches' names? Uh, we have Meritez, we have uh, Micah, we have Aloha, and we have Elisa with us. Yeah. And do we have Mike today or, or Micah? Micah? I don't see Micah here. Okay, and they are all uh, leaders in, in uh, OER and equity at their California community colleges. So today our agenda really is, uh, we're just gonna, uh, a real brief overview of, of the Community College Consortium for OER. And then we're uh, gonna hear from Dr. Frank Harris and I'm gonna introduce him in just a moment. I, I think <clears throat> most of you know him, um, but just in case. And uh, then um, uh, Dr. Frank Harris will speak with us for um, about 45 minutes, I think is what his plan is. And then he's gonna open it up to Q&A. Uh, he's also, uh, it says, please use the chat window um, to communicate during the, um, during his presentation. So um, bear with me while I share with you this very impressive um, uh, CV resume from Dr. Frank Harris. He's a professor of post-secondary education and co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab at San Diego State University. He's also a senior strategist in the Division of Campus Diversity and Student Affairs. In this role, he advises on efforts to institutionalize equity and designs innovative professional learning experiences to build equity mindedness among faculty and staff. He is best known for his exper expertise in racial inequity in post-secondary education and has made important contributions to knowledge about college student development and the social construction of gender and race in college context. His work prioritizes populations that have been historically underrepresented and underserved in education. Harris's scholarship has been published in, in leading journals for higher education and student affairs research and practice. And his commentary has been sought by high profile media outlets, including CNN, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times and the Chronicle of Higher Education. He has worked with more than 100 post-secondary institutions, community organizations, and nonprofits on student equity, student success, and institutional transformation. He's also delivered more than 1,000 academic and professional presentations. During the Obama administration, um, Dr. Harris was invited to the White House to share his knowledge and expertise on the status of boys and men in color in education. Before joining the faculty at San Diego State, he worked as a student affairs educator and college administrator in student crisis support and advocacy, student orientation, multicultural student affairs, academic advising and enrollment services. He was also an adjunct professor of speech communications at Los Angeles Trade Technical College. He earned his bachelor's degree in communication studies at Loyola Marymount 
a master's degree in speech communication at California State University Northridge and his doctorate in higher education from the University of Southern California. So this is definitely a California person. Um, and uh, Dr. Frank Harris, would you like to say anything before we uh, do a little intro on uh, the CCCOER uh, community? No, thank you, Yuna, for the, the wonderful introduction, a very warm and welcoming introduction. I'm excited to be here, excited for the conversation. And uh, shout out to all of my, my adjunct and part-time faculty colleagues. Uh, I learned a lot in that experience. And so uh, thank you for the work that you do, if we have any joining us today. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Yes. So very, very briefly, um, the Community College Consortium for OER um, has been around since 2007, working with community colleges on adoption um, of high quality open educational resources and practices in order to support uh, faculty choice around instructional materials in order to improve student equity and success. We also work with OER leaders around the country uh, to share and collaborate on issues of policy, stewardship, sustainability, and professionalism. And we are um, so excited to now be in 35 states uh, with uh, 91 members. And it, this all actually started in California. And we're so pleased that the California Community College Chancellor's Office is a member and we have 14 individual college members just within California. And um, very briefly, once again, for those of you who haven't joined us before, uh, the Open for Anti-Racism project is a pilot project that we are so thrilled to uh, be running here for the first time with the support of the William and for Flora Hewlett Foundation. It's a program for faculty to explore how they can use open educational resources and open pedagogy to make instructional materials and in their teaching more anti-racist. Uh, they have taken a four week intensive course back in January to learn about all of these topics and they are implementing action plans in their classroom uh, this spring in collaboration with their students. And we have over 17, uh, well we have do have 17 uh, California Community College facts faculty who were selected this for this program and they're really dispersed uh, around the state and we're also I think most proud of the the, the variety of dis disciplines from administration of justice biology business chemistry counseling early childhood education emergency medical technician English ESL history math social work and sociology and uh, we will, and next month, we will actually be hearing from some of these faculty about the work they've done this spring with their students. And now, without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Frank Harris, and I will stop sharing so that he can share his screen. Awesome, thank you so much, Yuna. Uh, sounds, sounds like a wonderful um, community that we have here, right? A community of folks that are you know, thinking about innovative and creative ways to, to use uh, OER and to meld that with equity-minded pedagogy. And, and you know, of course, I think all of us are challenged today to think about how we can be more intentionally um, infuse principles and concepts related to racial equity and more more importantly, um, anti-racism into all of the work that we do with students. And so I'm just you know, thrilled to play a small role in uh, the conversation and, and hopefully contributing in some ways that are value-added for everyone who's here today. Um, before I begin, I wanna start with, with offering a land acknowledgement, letting you know that I am joining you here from uh, you know, the Southern California region, more specifically San Diego. Um, we're on occupied Kumeyaay land. And of course, this is a land that has protected us that has healed us, that has inspired us and nourished us and continues to do, has done so for generations and continues to do so. And so what I hope to, um, to be able to you know, talk about today is really, um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, this first bullet point talking about the ways in which culturally diverse learners are disproportionately um, impacted in post-secondary education. Not gonna spend a lot of time on that uh, because I think everyone has a pretty good sense of 
you know, um, what that is and, and what some of the trends and patterns are here. Uh, we'll spend most of my time on strategies. How do we inform equity, uh, infuse equity mindedness and, you know, being culturally affirming uh, into the work that we do with students in the classroom, all with the goal of creating spaces that are intentionally and unapologetically anti-racist. And of course, you know, we know there's an urgent need to do that for several reasons. Uh, you know, some are articulated here when we think about the current context, um, you know, this global pandemic that of course is, has um, disproportionately impacted communities of color, right? Uh, whether we're talking about those who've been, you know, unfortunately killed by the virus, but also when we look at infection rates and now when we see those who have access to vaccines that there's some, some huge disparities there with regard to race. The, the racial reckoning, I mean, there's not, what more can I say about that? We continue to have um, people of color that are killed by law enforcement. Um, and, you know, we, we had two, well, one is that, that, that we, you know, Dante Wright, um, you know, in Minnesota that occurred earlier this week. And then, uh, you know, we learned about um, another young man um, in Chicago who, you know, there was body cam video released of that, that um, was just, just really difficult to see and watch. Um, and then, you know, there's some other ways and you know, other, other issues here related to this racial awaken awakening here, but it all speaks to the need to be more intentionally anti-racist in the work that we do. Um, the economic recession that's going to, you know, continue to have some impact. It's going to impact our institutions, but more importantly, it's probably going to impact our students. When we think about community college students um, and relying on things like the service industries, for example, as a way to be able to, to pay to go to school, to be able to, uh, you know, make ends meet with regard to taking care of themselves and taking care of their family members. Um, there's certainly some concern there. The, the, the presidential election was incredibly intense. That continues to have some impact on our current context. Uh, there was this insurrection at the Capitol that we all, um, that was both horrific and we all experienced it. And then we see this, um, you know, this, this growing rash of, of hate crimes that target our Asian American Pacific Islander, Desi American community. And so, you know, it's just to say that the current social political context really underscores the urgency and the need for us to have conversations like this, but more importantly, not to just talk about it, but to change something, to do things differently than the way we've traditionally done them. Um, I should also add that all of this is happening while we're trying to teach classes and, you know, in some cases, run divisions and run institutions remotely. And so there's a, there's a lot that's being asked of us and we, we need to continue to build our capacity because the context from what we can tell is gonna to continue to shift and seems to be more dynamic than it's ever been before. Um, all of this is, speaks to the need to um, infuse equity or approach our work from an equity-minded perspective. Of course, when we're talking about equity at its core, we're talking about enacting intentional strategies to meet the needs of groups that have been disproportionately impacted in our colleges and in our institutions. Um, you know, we know when we look at most indicators of student success, uh, whether we're looking at course success rates, persistence rates, transfer rates, um, whatever it may be, there are certain groups of students who consistently show up as disproportionately impacted, right? Our racially minoritized students, um, our adult learners, our students with disabilities, former foster youth, justice impacted students, uh, members of the LGBTQIA community. And so all of that speaks to the need for us to, again, to think about uh, and figure out what intentional strategies help to address these disparities and to close gaps, gaps both in outcomes, but also gaps in experiences that are not as easily measured, but show up in our outcomes in one way or another. And we have to approach all of this through the lens of equity mindedness. Um, the work of Estella Ben-Simone speaks to the need to be equity minded. Uh, her work also talks about these five characteristics of equity mindedness. Again, I'm not gonna read them and fully do a full unpacking of them, but just as a reminder, of what equity mindedness is and uh, how it's related to equity. Now, those of you who've seen myself or my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Wood, uh, present before, you're probably familiar with this next framework that I'm gonna share. So if you've seen it before, I think repeated engagement sometimes helps uh, when, when it comes to concepts and things of that nature. And if you've seen it for the first time, I hope you find it to be, again, uh, insightful and value added to advancing your understanding uh, of equity and equity mindedness. But 
we developed this framework a few years ago because Luke and I were having many conversations with many colleagues and we were encountering many perspectives on equity. And so we felt like we needed to have something, some kind of framework, some kind of tool that allowed us to make sense of the, the range of perspectives we were encountering, but um, also to, to give our colleagues who were leading conversations and designing professional learning experiences on their campuses to have something to guide and inform their perspectives as well. So out of that need came this taxonomy. And you can see that the taxonomy um, essentially has two constructs. The first is uh, what we describe as competence situated at the top here. And we can simply think about competence as an educator's knowledge and understanding of equity and equity minded practices. I know what it is and uh, I know why it's important and I know what to do to infuse it into my teaching, right? So I got it, I, I, I get it. Uh, the second construct, however, is also important. And we can think about that construct as motivation because one thing we all know as educators, knowing how to do something in and of itself is it, it's, 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 um, necessary, but insufficient when it comes to actually being able to do it or being willing to do it, right? This, so this, this piece around motivation becomes very important. And so when we take the uh, box here that's labeled KW, this captures the perspective of educators who know what equity is and who know what equity mindedness is and they practice it on a regular basis, right? They are already infusing it. They've already uh, done the things that they need to do to build their capacity to teach from an equity minded, culture affirming perspective. Perhaps predictably, we call this group the choir. And we call this group the choir, choir because more often than not, it's the choir that's leading the efforts and leading the conversations on their campuses, right? These are the folks who are saying, hey, you know what? This is not acceptable. We have to be better. We have to do better. Um, and, and, and really motivating their colleagues to think about their work differently, to approach their work differently. Maybe they're bringing in the resources, they're bringing in information, they're inviting speakers to get to, to campus, but they're the ones that are the leading voices when it comes to equity, both in terms of the importance of it, but also in terms of modeling and practicing it on a regular basis. There's also another group that's just as important as the choir that we call the allies. The only thing that separates the choir from the allies for the most part is that the allies haven't had the coaching, they haven't had the professional development, they haven't had the opportunity to learn about equity and equity mindedness and to really infuse it into their practices with students. However, if you give them the opportunity to learn it, they could just as easily become a part of the choir. So when we're talking about any type of institutional change efforts or any efforts around professional learning, the ally is it's, it's more often than not our target group. This is the group that we're trying to uh, engage in some outreach to, right? A group that's open, a group that's willing, a group that has the motivation and simply needs to build their capacity from the perspective of knowledge and strategies, right? So this is all, this is a very important, you know, part of our efforts here. Now, some of you are probably thinking it'd be easier if we could just stop there, but we can't. Because if our goal is institutional transformation, right? Where we want these practices and we want these conversations to not just be happening at pockets, you know, pockets here and there, but for them to be embraced and to become a part of the institutional culture, we have to engage some other perspectives. Like the next one we see here, we call our resistors. And these are the folks who haven't been trained. They, um, they, they, they haven't embraced equity or equity mindedness. They don't see it as necessary. They're not motivated to do it. And those of you who've heard me or Luke speak before, you probably recall, we said that there are two types of resistors, active resistors and passive resistors. Active resistors are the ones who are simply the most vocal and forthcoming about their opposition to equity and equity efforts. These are the folks who are saying, why are we doing this? This is, you know, this is not important. This is not necessary. If these students don't have the knowledge or the resources, if they don't have what it takes to su succeed here, then perhaps they don't belong here, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is this, right? Some of you may see this as good news, perhaps some may not, but most resistors are actually what we would describe as passive resistors. So they're not gonna be as vocal and transparent about their opposition to equity, but they're also going to avoid any and every opportunity there is to be authentically engaged in it. So you say Frank Harris is coming to campus, 
and he's coming to speak to us about equity and equity mindedness and how we can infuse it into our teaching. This is a voluntary thing. Everybody's invited. Bring your bag, brown bag lunch. Come and check it out. These folks are not going to show up, right? They're not coming. And so we always talk about the need. Again, if our goal is institutional transformation, then we have to take these conversations, the ones that we're having today, and it's important to have them with the choir and with the allies, but we also have to bring them into places and spaces where folks who are not already on board are present so that they have to hear what we have to say. Then we have our next uh, group that we call the Defiant. Now, here's what's interesting about the Defiant. They actually have a good understanding of equity and equity mindedness. However, they refuse to enact the practices with the students who need the support the most. So they're not really concerned about disproportionately impacted students, right? Students who may not be having a good experience, students who are not well served in one way or another, um, but they're most concerned about students who look like them, students who may be working in their research lab, or students who may be, be one of their work study students, or the kids who play baseball with their kids. They're not at all concerned about, you know, addressing uh, disproportionate impact. That's just not a priority for them. Now, um, one time Luke and I was presenting this framework and we were approached by a colleague immediately after who said, Luke, Frank, like the framework, makes a lot of sense, certainly aligned with my experiences and what I see in working with colleagues, but it's missing something. What about the folks who think they're equity minded, who think they're part of the choir, but they really have no idea what they're doing or what they're talking about? And so Luke and I reflected on that uh, for a little bit of time, and we decided to add a fifth group to our taxonomy, a group that we call the Oblivious. And we call this group the Oblivious because one can arrive at becoming oblivious in one of three ways, typically one of three ways. The first is when we approach our equity work from a savior complex, when we believe that our work is about saving students rather than empowering them. And I think a core part of being equity minded is rejecting deficit narratives, deficit notions and deficit perspectives of students. And so really believing that our students have everything that it takes to be successful. And so our role as educators is not to save them, but to eliminate the stuff that gets in the way, to eliminate the institutional barriers, eliminate, you know, identify and eliminate the stuff that doesn't allow them to maximize their potential as learners, right? That's, that, that's very different than this, this notion of saving students. Saving is, is the, the notion, you know, these poor students, they don't have what it takes to be successful. They need us to save them, right? They can't, they quote unquote, can't do it without us, which is a you know, different perspective. Next is when we're not reflective, when our words and the values that we espouse are not aligned with our actions and the ways in which we teach and serve students. So you can't be in the meetings talking about equity and equity mindedness. And then when we go and observe what you're doing in a classroom, you're microaggressing students, um, you know, you're, you're not using a range of pedagogy, uh, you know, teaching methods, you're, you're using one strategy to assess students, you are uh, penalizing students who may not have purchased a textbook, right? Um, and so when we talk about being equity and equity minded, a big part of what we have to do is to make sure the values and the words that we espouse are aligned with the actions and the ways in which we teach and serve students. And this last one, the one that bugs me the most is grandstanding. And grandstanding is really about, um, this is when our commitment to equity is really more about developing a reputation for it or advancing our careers or being perceived a certain way by our colleagues than it is about equity. Um, you know, when I started doing this work, uh, you know, I would say in the, the early to mid 2000s, um, you know, equity was in many ways seen as a bad word in many spaces and on many campuses. Right, it's not as it wasn't a concept, it wasn't a practice that was as widely embraced as it is now. Right now, it's not so bad to be the equity person on your campus. Right now, as, 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 as being an equity champion, you can get promoted, you can get invited to serve on search committees. Right, there's all these opportunities and all these ways to elevate and leverage being the equity person on campus. And so, I think as a result of that we get some folks who are not authentically committed to the work and who really, um, again, who really are approaching this and see this 
as a way to leverage and advance their own careers than it is about helping the institution achieve institutional transformation. And of course, helping students achieve their goals and everything that comes with um, being a student. And so before I continue, I think this is a good place. I see the chat has been, uh, I haven't been able to read the chat messages, but it looks like there've been some comments there. So I wanna stop and sort of see if anyone has any thoughts or reactions to anything that I've shared thus far or any points of disagreement. Uh, I would I would invite as well. And if you could do me a favor, if you could in, introduce yourself before you you offer your statement, uh, just your name and, and where it is that you work, I would I, I would um, would greatly appreciate that. And I see Cindy Stevens um, is the first hand that I see. Go for it, Cindy. Hi, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Harris. I, I heard you speak many many times, and I'm just so grateful that you're here. I am from College of the Canyons, and I teach early childhood education. Um, and I'm a part of OFAR. And I, I just wanted to um, just echo what you said in this last moment. I, I totally am in 100% agreement with those that are grandstanding. In fact, I think they get in our way much more than some of the other folks that you're mentioning because they talk about it and they have no idea what they're talking about. They, you know, they're using it exactly what you said. And I think this is, um, I would love to hear some strategies. I hear, I know this happens many spaces that I'm in where I'm trying, you know, I, I work in a lot of different arenas. I'm president of a um, TRICE-ECE, which is California Community Ecology Early Childhood Educators. And I'm a consultant for PEACH, which is another early childhood. And we're trying to do this work. We're trying to do this, you know, um, create this, you know, anti-racist institutions. And the, the grandstanders are just so, they just get in the way. And uh, maybe you have some strategies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for sharing your perspective. And, and I, I can sense and understand your frustration uh, as well. And so um, grandstanding, some people call it performative allyship, uh, virtual signaling. I mean, we're starting to see all sorts of different, different ways to describe it. But um, here's, uh, you know, here's, here's what we have to understand when it, when it comes to, to grandstanding. When it comes to any of these perspectives, to be honest with you, uh, but actually, no, that's, let's focus on grants. Let's focus on the ability to grandstanders. Cindy, you made a point that I think is really important. When you ask folks, right, folks who are really deeply committed and deeply engaged in equity work, what is more of a barrier to, to any type of advancement? What's more problematic? Is it the resistors and the defiant or is it the grandstanders or those who are oblivious, right? So we, we, we sort of juxtapose those as, you know, toxic support versus toxic resistance. Most folks say they would much rather encounter, they would much rather deal with an active resistor than a grandstander. Be for the reason that you, you, you highlighted, Cindy, at least with someone who's actively resistant, I kind of know, know where that person stands, right? There's a transparency there. And I may not agree, we may not share their, pers we may not share perspectives, but I at least know what I'm dealing with. I at least know where they're coming from maybe we could have a conversation and maybe there, there might be some convergence in some areas where we might be able to agree. But with someone who's a grandstander, right? Or some, when we talk about toxic support, I have a hard time working with that person because I don't really know what to expect. In one meeting, they're saying one thing. In another meeting, they're saying something else. And I have no idea how to really authentically engage and work with this person because they're kind of all over the place. And quite frankly, um, it doesn't really help us in any, any real meaningful way. And so I think that is, uh, that's something that, that we all struggle with, or probably there's at least one colleague or one person who, uh, you know, who exhibits that behaviors that, that, that we have to uh, engage in some way. Now, here's the part that most of you are probably not going to like that I'm going to, that I'm going to say in terms of how do you deal with this? You have to deal with it with humility, with grace, and with collegiality. So what does that mean, Frank? That means that I gotta be able to engage this person in a way that's critical, that's transparent, but to do it in a way that still somehow preserves our relationship as colleagues. And so with someone who's oblivious, I may have to say, you know, Frank, you know, I, I appreciate you as a colleague. I think you know you contribute in some valuable ways. But you know, when you 
or in the search committee meeting and you say, well, you know, we don't have any qualified candidates of color because, you know, most of them aren't, you know, they, they aren't in this area. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't really help us advance the conversation and the work that we're trying to do right now. And, and a lot of times it's not what you say, but how you say it. And so somehow we got to find a way to, 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 to be transparent, but to do so in a way that, again, allows someone allows us to still be colleagues with that person, uh, which is incredibly difficult to do uh, at times. But that, I think that that at least has to be the goal and intention when we when we have these interactions and conversations. Uh, there was another hand. I don't see it here, but I want to uh, and I don't know if it's because I was, you know, blabbering too much. I think it was Aaron Thomas, maybe who uh, had a hand up, Aaron. I don't know if you still have a question. If, if so, I'd love to. Um, Love to have you ask it now. If not, no worries. You could completely ignore that I, what I just said. Okay, maybe one more. Any others? All right. I see Yoon Jung Park. Sure, I'll I'll, I'll go. Um, and uh, just hearing you name it and say it is really therapeutic. <laughs> Uh, for me, and I have to echo the sentiments of Cindy in echoing uh, Dr. West that we have to be willing to die every day, which is why now my homepage is Prometheus. <laughs> um, right. Because it's it's intense emotional labor. And that's the part that, you know, I think a lot of us struggle with is that willingness to be misunderstood and still have the bounce back, you know, and that's, that's hard. Um, and so I just want to uh, express my appreciation for everyone and also recognize that it takes a lot of emotional labor to do the humility, grace, collegiality when you just Hard. want to slap them. You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, 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 you know what? And let's be honest. Sometimes it just feels better to just let somebody have it, right? I mean, you walk away feeling like, yeah, I just really told that person what time it was. Um, and maybe that feels good in the moment. Maybe that feels good for, you know, some period of time. But if the goal is to exhibit leadership in this space and to bring folks in, right, to get more people to be a part of the choir and to be allies, but if we, you know, this, this whole idea of, you know, being graceful and humility, is, is it has to be something that we lead with. And the humility part is really important as well, because no matter how far along or how much we think we know, we all have, we all screw up. You know, we all say the wrong thing sometimes. We all make mistakes. And we're going to uh, expect some, some grace when we, when, when we miss, misstep as well, right? Um, and so I think that's, that, that's part of what, what we have to commit to doing. But I, I hear you. I feel you. And, um, you know, there have been times when, I haven't followed the, the advice that I'm giving and every single time I've regretted it. And that's just, just being honest with you. All right, Truth Atkins, Martin, you get the last word and then it will, we'll go back. Oh, hi, can you hear me okay? Absolutely, loud awesome. and clear. Thank you so much. I came in a little bit late, so I just appreciate being here. And I just wanted to add that um, there's so many awesome people doing this work in urban edge like San Diego County Office of Education, a lot oh, yeah. of the things. And, and um, it's like, it'd be nice to have them just supported for the work that they are already doing. You know, a lot of the urban areas have been working um, with the anti-racism and equity, you know, and education. And I think it's just, it would be like an act of humility to like support them and, and lift them, you know, that have those programs in place. But sometimes I'll hear it like it's a brand new thing, like, oh, this is new, you know, and it's like, it's been, you know, since the 1960s and 50s and 40s, and, you know, but I appreciate yeah. this, everything everyone does. I just wanted to comment. I appreciate it. Being here. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate the comment, uh, Truth. Um, you know, I think when it comes to some of these concepts, some of them have been around a long time. Uh, and maybe what we see are new ways of presenting them and packaging them, or, you know, maybe they've been, you know, I like to say updated to, to meet, you know, and match the current context. But yeah, I, you know, I would say some of, um, 
I think I, I still think there are some new ideas and new approaches and new ways of doing things, but I also think that there are some some lessons that we can learn from from reading and looking back into what's been done before. Um, I think there's some some value in that uh, as well. As I, I appreciate what you're sharing. Let me um, let's dive into strategies here, and then hopefully we'll have at least ten, maybe even you know fifteen more minutes uh, to end with with dialogue and Q and A. And so let me. Um, let me, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and go right to strategies. And so bear with me for a few slides here. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to share about, I don't know, maybe uh, a half dozen of, of strategies and practices that I think are important for, for any educator that's looking to infuse equity, equity mindedness, uh, anti-racism into their courses. And so a few caveats here, uh, everything I'm going to share with you is based on the work that my colleagues and I in the Community College Equity Assessment Lab have been doing for you know, the past decade with, with, with hundreds of institutions. And so everything I'm gonna share, none of it is, are things that I've made up. These are all practices that I have seen to be, that have been proven effective. Of course, um, some things are gonna be more, uh, you know, more specific to, to certain contexts. So you may say, wow, that, that works really well in STEM or that really that works really well, you know, in ESL or early childhood um, and other things. You say, yeah, I can see this working regardless of what the content or what the course may be. So keep that in mind. Um, also, it's important, again, it's not just about applying the strategies. It's about applying them from an equity minded perspective. That's really important. And the ultimate goal here is, is, to, uh, is to obtain an optimal balance between challenging students and supporting students while also conveying high expectations and authentic care. And we're gonna get into you know, some details about what those concepts are and what they look like. But one of the first things I think we have to do is to be race conscious. Think very critically and very intentionally about how does race uh, impact and influence the teaching and learning experience for students, right? And some things that we can that we have to recognize is this: when we look at the curriculum in most disciplines, right? My area, you know, I, my master's degree and undergraduate degree are in communication studies, speech communication. What I'm about to say applies to speech. It also applies to psychology, math. It doesn't really matter. By and large, when we look at our curriculum, the voices, perspectives, and contributions of Black and Indigenous people of color are largely invisible. And if they show up in the curriculum, it's usually showing up, you know, um, in, in, in a negative way or in a sort of a deficit way, doesn't talk about important contributions made. Um, a lot of what students learn in these areas are not directly related to their lived experiences. So, you know, as a person of color, I can't understand how these things, these concepts and things that I'm learning, how they apply to the things that I see every day in my community or in my lived experiences. Um, and so when we think about curriculum, most curricular, uh, for the most part, what they do is they systematically advance white supremacy. And so I think when it comes to being race conscious, it really does mean asking the question, how does the curriculum that I'm developing, how is the courses that I'm developing to teach this curriculum, how does it continue to advance white supremacy? And what are some things that I can do to intentionally disrupt that? We also have to think about you know, things like invisibility and hyper surveillance. Not gonna get into a lot of details there other than to say that when it comes to the experiences of black and indigenous people of color, um, invisibility in the sense that it's usually not people who, who look like you that are teaching the classes. I've already talked about how your experience is largely absent in the curriculum, at least in a positive way, right? So that's where the invisibility comes in. But at the same time, there's a tendency to feel like you're being hyper surveilled. When there's an exam, right? The, the, the instructor is looking at you more closely. If you happen to arrive a few minutes late, everyone turns and notices. If a topic around civil rights or slavery or crime or something like that comes up, everyone looks to you for your perspective. And so it's this, this, this dualistic experience of having to navigate being invisible in the ways that matter but being hyper surveilled in a ways that you would rather not, that really creates a triggering uh, experience for many of our Black and Indigenous uh, uh, students. And then also um, the issue of racial microaggressions, 
uh, is really essential here. Um, we know three, the three most common racial microaggressions that are experienced is an inscription of intelligence when we assign a degree of intelligence based on race. Pathologizing culture is when we assume that black and indigenous people of color come from families and communities that don't value education. And an assumption of criminology is when we associate uh, racially minoritized identities with being thugs, deviants, and criminals. And so these are things that we have to be mindful of. These are patterns that we consistently see that have to inform what we do in the classroom with students. Next, we have to, uh, we have to talk about being intrusive. And being intrusive essentially means that we don't sit back and wait for students to invite us to support them. When we're intrusive, we take a proactive approach to doing so, right? And so, for example, if we're talking about an online course or any course, for example, right, one of the most important and, and intrusive practices that we can employ is to transparently and proactively answer the question, what will it take to be successful in this course? What resources will I need? How should I approach things like the readings and notes and preparing for exams, right? A lot of times we assume that students already know how to do it, or if they don't know how to do it, it's their responsibility to figure it out. Um, but let me give you an example here. One quick example of note-taking is one that I really wanna highlight here. We know that note-taking is one of the most important skills that you could have as a learner, right? Regardless of where you are, or what it is that you're learning. But we also know that there are literally hundreds of different ways to take notes. And so we also know that some note-taking note strategies are gonna work well in some classes than they would in other classes. And so one thing that we would suggest is say, okay, we're gonna be intrusive, take some time early in the course, demonstrate to the students, how do you take notes? And how is, what are a good set of notes gonna look like for your class? And what are some examples of good notes uh, that, what are some examples of uh, what good notes look like and how can you use these examples to create and build your notes, right? And so the key point here is that regardless of what we're talking about here is you don't wanna leave students guessing and wondering what it is that they need to do to be successful. We wanna proactively answer that question, right? And we also wanna, you know, again, if we're thinking about the pandemic and remote learning, hopefully most of us are gonna be making some sort of return to campus sometime in the fall. Uh, my sense is we probably won't be, you know, fully there until spring 2020, excuse me, spring 22 at the earliest. And so we really have to think about what are the resources and information students need in order to really successfully experience a course. So doing some sort of informal assessment at the outset. First time taking an online learning course, how are you going to be accessing it? What concerns do you have? How can I best facilitate your learning? Uh, short email videos right, any type of tools or anything that you can do to support learning, right, and to support access, to support open access with as few barriers as possible is really aligned with this whole idea of being intrusive. We also have to be relational. So one thing that, one of the most important and consistent lessons that we continue to learn in our work at SEAL, regardless of what type of study we're doing, regardless of who we're talking to, is authentic relationships between students and educators that are grounded in trust, mutual respect, and authentic care, whether we're talking about online environments or in-person environments, are absolutely critical to student success. We also know this, those relationships are most likely to be established when the educator takes on the responsibility of creating the conditions for them to happen. A lot of times it's, I have office hours, Students know where to find me. If they need something, they can reach out. If they don't reach out, I'm assuming everything is good. And that's a dangerous assumption, right? Especially today. And so the goal, the thing that we have to do is to first and foremost, let students know that we are partners in the learning process with them. And that I'm not successful as an educator if you're not successful as a student. Also, being willing to talk with them informally about things that have nothing to do with the course, right? That's where relationships are often formed. And so I know sometimes, you know, we might think about things like learning about students' hometown and learning their names and learning about, you know, their hobbies, right? We may think about those as trivial details that have nothing to do with learning, but it's these type of details that can often be helpful 
and building relationships with students, right? Um, we also know this, is that validation is really, really important, right? I know, um, you know, sort of the, 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 the prevailing um, perspective today is all about, you know, self-love and self-care and self-validation. And I'm all for that. I, I think those things are important. But our learners, right, particularly those who may have been marginalized in education for most, you know, through high school, for most of the time they've been in school, they need to hear from educators on a consistent basis. You're smart. You can be successful. You're intelligent. You belong here. I'm proud of you. Keep up the good work. They need to hear that on a regular basis from more than just one person. And so all of this speaks to the need to be relational and some things that we can do to, um, to intentionally build relationships with students. We also have to be culturally relevant and affirming, which really in some ways speaks to some of the things that we talked about with regard to anti-racism. What does it mean? What is a culturally affirming uh, you know, course or uh, experience I should say look like? Here's some examples. When we center diverse learners in every aspect of the course, first and foremost, and folks like Gloria Latson Billings and other scholars who study this, they say that it's not just important for you know racially minoritized students; it's important for all students, right? It's important for all students, even white students, can benefit from a course that's that's rooted, uh, that's culturally relevant and culturally affirming. It's about acknowledging the diverse, uh, the the cont intellectual contributions of diverse people. We've talked about that and why that's important. And infusing positive images of diverse people in the course and making sure that the things that you're teaching, that somehow they are connected to the lived experience, students' lived experiences, the things that they experience on a regular basis, right? How does it help them make sense of what they deal with and what they go through and what they see and observe on a regular basis, right? And then what, what are some things that we can do to make sure our courses are culturally relevant and affirming? I'm not gonna, there, there are 10 things here. I'm not gonna highlight all 10, but some things that I do wanna pinpoint is, uh, you know, making sure, look, number three, making sure the course is rooted in an ethos that prioritizes community and collaboration as opposed to competitiveness. Uh, some other things that we can do, using a range of strategies to assess student learning is another one. We all know, right? We've, we've all been educators long enough to know that there is more than one, that there's a, there's a thing um, known as learning strengths. And some of us are better at certain types of learning and certain types of ways of demonstrating our learning than others. And so one thing that we have to do is to use a range of strategies to assess student learning, not just exams, not just term papers, not just oral presentations, but maybe all of them. Right, or at least give students some options. Creates more work for us as educators, right? Because that may mean for one assignment, you may need three or four different rubrics, but imagine how this opens up the space for students and how uh, the, 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 the positive impact it can have on student learning. Maybe just one more here that I think is important. And uh, it's number 10, making sure that every policy that we create where this related to attendance or grading or, or participation or requiring textbooks or even how our assignments are submitted, that they do not disadvantage populations that are already disproportionately impacted. And we don't often think about this, right? Sometimes we say, listen, the textbook is required. Everybody got to get it, everybody got to read it. But we don't think about, well, what about a student who may not have the financial resources to afford the $200 textbook that you're only going to use three chapters in anyway? Right. Think about how does this policy, how is it what I'm doing? Is it likely to have an impact on disproportionately impacted students? And if so, is there a way that I can reconsider it as well? Um, I'm going to skip ahead here. This is the last thing I'm going to share is really thinking about the syllabus, the course syllabus. We often think about the syllabus as just a document or a contract, but the syllabus really does set the tone for the relationship that will be formed between students and the educators. So making sure that we're using language in the syllabus that's not punitive, that doesn't just communicate rules, but that really lets students know that you believe in them, you believe that they can be successful, that you care about them, dare I say that, and that their success 
is in many ways a reflection of your effectiveness and your success as an educator. I know some of this is stuff that you all may have talked about as a part of the consortium. And if so, you know, if you're hearing it again, you know, I apologize, but again, I often think repeated engagement, sometimes you need to hear the right thing more than once for it really to stick. And so I hope um, if there's anything that's been repeated that you've seen and heard before that it's having that impact. Um, thank you all so much for allowing me to, to be a part of your community. Uh, looks like we have about eight minutes for any dialogue and Q&A. And so I would be happy to hear anything that anyone has to share. The first hand that I see is a colleague from San Diego, Palomar College, Hasna, Dr. Hasna. How are you? Good seeing you. Hello, Dr. Oh, hello, hello. I, I was, uh, I've been honored because uh, you were my professor in my doc program. So a lot of my education and a lot of my activism is, is due to you and, and your leadership and your teaching. So thank you. Um, Mike, Great. one of the things that resonated with me that you shared was um, all the different recommendations that you had for uh, faculty and practitioners to look at when it comes to um, really validating students um, in our institutions and providing equity-minded praxis. I've noticed that in, the, in our community college system, they, it, it's so automatic for people to say, go see a counselor. You need validation, go see a counselor. You need to be affirmed, go see a counselor. And so we become these, in, you know, which I don't mind. I, don't, I do that anyways. It doesn't matter who comes into my classroom or my counseling session, I do that. But what the goal is from what you're sharing is how can educators uh, employ those uh, praxis in their classroom, if it's within their curriculum, within their pedagogy, within their praxis. And I think the challenge is how do we get our colleges to, to move to that direction because there's a lot of resistance by you know instructional faculty saying, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just the content expertise. I'm not here to counsel students. That's not what I do. Um, and there's a lot of stigma against that. So I would, just wanted to ask you what suggestions you have in terms of us changing that paradigm. Yeah, thank you, Hasna. I, uh, I had a, you know, when you're asking that question, I almost chuckled a little bit because I remember I was, um, I was doing an interview with a faculty member a while ago. And, um, you know, we were talking about this whole idea, right? About conveying authentic care and all this stuff. And, and, and the colleague said, you know, what do you want me to do? I'm, I'm a professor, I'm not a social worker, right? That was the reaction. And some folks really have that perspective. It's like, hey, I am here to teach content. All this other stuff y'all are talking about, I'm not, first of all, I'm not trained to do it, right? And second, I don't really think that that's what students need to be successful. And so a big part of what we have to do is to help uh, challenge this myth about you know, being caring and being validating that that's only something that counselors do. That's only something that social workers do, right? And really sort of make direct and transparent connections between those behaviors and that, that ethos that you're creating and student success. Right. And I think one thing that I think, you know, I'm going to make an assumption here, bear with me. I think all faculty, regardless of what it is that they teach or do, care about student success. Right. And so when we can make connections to student success, or sometimes they need to hear it from students, and we can provide opportunities for students to say, yeah, you know what? Um, I did really well in this class. And part of why I did well is because the professor or the instructor really made it comfortable and easy, not, not, not comfortable in the sense that, you know, they just made the content easy, but they created a climate in the context that made me feel comfortable to where I was able to learn, I was willing to speak up, I was willing to ask for help, I was willing to take risk, right, that helped me as a learner. That's where we have to, we have to do a better job of helping make those connections more transparent. And I, you know, um, and I say that we don't always do that. And in some ways we should kind of understand where they're coming from, right? Like if I'm a sociology professor, I mean, wh where would I have learned about authentic care and building relationships? Where would I have learned that? I wouldn't learn, it's not something I learned in graduate school. And so I think in some ways we have to give them some grace when they have that perspective, but we also have to be willing to bring resources and information and tell them, yeah, I understand it's different from what you've been tra trained to do, 
right? But let me tell you why it's important to do. And let me support you in being able to think about some ways that you can seamlessly integrate this type of working with students into your classes, right? That's, uh, I think that's a starting point, but thank you, Hasan, a great question. All right, I see Sharon Sampson and Joel Friedman in that order. So we'll, we'll take them in that order. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Harris. I do yep, have a question, you. I appreciate uh, new knowledge. Um, this cohort, this OFAR um, class has really promoted, um, I'm provided opportunity to kick it up a notch. I am a criminal justice or AOJ faculty. And yeah. so those students who are familiar with my style, with the classes, um, with the courses that they've had to be introduced to in cases like Trayvon Martin, really looking at taking a deeper dive, um, are accustomed to my mannerisms and the way I present those cases. This OFAR has allowed now to really focus on racism and anti-racism in my courses. And there's a lot of pushback from my students. Yeah. Uh, because apparently I'm the only one that's having them really take a deeper dive into the kinds of mindset. Because I'm concerned that if they don't make it into law enforcement, they'll eventually be a juror or vote for policies and procedures that are gonna impact people of color, marginalized communities. How do you continue to move forward in this work without having to, I feel like I'm feeling to, to move back a little bit um, and water down some of the things that I'm presenting because there's a lot of pushback. You know, Grossmont is a feeder from East County and the mindset, unfortunately, uh, based on that community, uh, not to the fault of the students, but the community itself is very conservative. So what recommendations do you have? Because I'm laying it, scaffolding, you know, to make sure that they understand where I'm coming from. But at the same time, they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Well, I don't think it's our, so when it comes to learning content that's new and difficult, Sometimes th that's uncomfortable, right? And so I don't think it's our responsibility to make difficult content comfortable to learn, right? As long as there's a learning, it's through the lens and from the perspective of learning and growth, right? Now, mm -hmm. some people may say, well, um, you know, I, I'm not talking about the discomfort that comes with being microaggressed, right? Or being, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, this is challenging content. It's really pushing me. It's really making me, you know, think critically about my values and my experiences. I don't like doing that. That's uncomfortable, but it does help me, you know, grow as a learner. That's I'm okay with that type of right because that's that's we all need that. Um, but to be honest with you, Professor, if they if if we if if folks can't understand now why we need to infuse conversations about implicit bias and racism and law. If, they, if we can't do it now, if, if it's not apparent now, then I don't know what else it's going to take. And so I don't think you should continue to work to convince people, right? I think you need to continue to do what you're doing, but make sure there are transparent connections between what you're teaching and the learning goals and learning outcomes, right? The competencies and things that they're gonna need as they enter the field of law enforcement, if that's what they you know, decide to do, criminal justice and so forth. But it's pretty apparent, uh, you know, if you ask me. Um, and so maybe it's just continuing to come, you know, continuing to show real life examples of the implications of what happens when we don't do it, right? Um, is what I would do. I know we're past time, but I do wanna take Joel's question. I'll, I'll respond to it briefly, and then I want to respect everyone's time and make sure we end, you know, uh, not long after. Thank you. Thank Go you, Professor Bill. Harris. I can be brief. I'm just interested in seeing my colleagues uh, rethink traditional grading, which yes. can be uh, punitive, uh, giving a student a zero for a, a non-submission, and then averaging that into what they have, what they have achieved is going to disadvantage that student unnecessarily. It assesses that student for something that is not taught in the class. It's not the skills that are being taught necessarily in the class and uh, just tends to be punitive and, and problematic. So I'm really interested in um, seeing a shift in the way uh, traditional grading is has, which hasn't changed for hundreds of years right. uh, to, to be reassessed and, and recalibrated. 
or at least inquire as to what's going on, right? Yeah, um, and the, and there are theories yeah. out there, but I can't. Yeah. Know, I time. Yeah. So you know, it's like, hey, I didn't, I didn't submit it. Well, what's, uh, well, why is it? You know, was it because you didn't have access to a resource you needed to do exactly. it? Was it? Did you encounter, you know, a challenge with regard to, you know, time or whatever it may be? Because those are things we could work through. But what I what I like to say is this: we should try to build in, build grace into the structure of the course. So it's great to, to have a policy uh, or to, 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 to intentionally inquire, right? But what if you structure your course, say, okay, this is our, this is our, this is what needs to be turned in, right? And by this point or this time, okay? And I'm gonna give you some options as to when it's turned in, what assignment, right? At this time in the semester, maybe it makes more sense for you to work on this assignment, right? And so, you know, almost taking a little bit of a portfolio approach to it, and then if you do that, then you give students a little bit more agency on, you know, when and how is best for them to, to, to do the work and submit the work. But even when you do that, I, I still think it's important yeah. to inquire and ask what's going on before you just fail a student or before you just give a zero. I agree. And, and that's and not necessarily an achieved of learning. As opposed to what isn't accomplished. Right. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you having me. Uh, I know this was a very challenging week for a lot of people, myself included. And so I just hope we can go into the weekend. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to say feeling better, but going to the weekend feeling like, you know, perhaps we made a difference in, in, in one way or another, be it large or small this week. And so uh, thank you all. I appreciate you. And I, Una, I will make sure I send you the slide deck to share with anyone who would like to have it. Thank you. Uh, Paris, can I ask one thing? I am wanting to take that ally course. Um, and I keep going on Cora. And do you know when it's going to be available? There's two courses. Um, I don't, but uh, follow up with me, Cindy, offline. I'm gonna put my email in the chat, and then I'll um, I can I can find out what's going on for you. Thank you. Great, and thank yep. you so much, Dr. Harris, for joining us today. And I know that this was not your first presentation of the day. Uh, so you were amazing uh, as thank always, and, and thank you so much. Um, this is the best and the most important one, all right? Uh, of course. These are the teachers right. who work directly with the students. Right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have me back. If, if, um, if you're inclined, I'd love to come back and continue the conversations. Thank you all. We will, we will definitely follow up on that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Right, take care. We just yep. have a few more things before uh, we finish out the, um, and James, I think you were going to uh, finish this off for us. Yes, indeed. Una, thanks for sharing the slides. And boy, we, I think we'd all like to spend the rest of the afternoon here with uh, Dr. Harris and with, with one another after a heavy week. Uh, so thanks again to Dr. Harris. And uh, just to just to take us out of out of the session today, uh, we'll advance the slide. Uh, reminder for those of you who were part of, part of the OFAR cohort cohort, uh, well, and for others um, who who have been participating in our webinars this spring, we have two more webinars this spring, and they are both opportunities for our OFAR participants to showcase uh, what they are doing or what they have been doing with their students. Uh, we do want to say to to those of you who may be thinking about uh, sharing what you've been doing, we know that some some projects and some some action plans have been easier to implement than others. So uh, we it's perfectly fine to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, we want to hear what you've learned, and uh, we hope you know that this is a supportive audience. Uh, so watch for announcements about May twenty first and June eighteenth. And next slide. Uh, in the chat throughout Dr. Harris's pre presentation, a number of us were pointing out the connection between uh, culturally relevant pedagogy and equity-minded practices and the tools of open educational resources and open pedagogy. Uh, you can, as always, you can learn more about, uh, about these things on the CCC OER website linked here. And uh, take note that here in the California Community Colleges, our friends in the Statewide Academic Senate have a tremendous uh, OER initiative, and you can find the link uh, here as well to all their resources. And if you want to keep up with everything that's happening in uh, the community college world of OER, join the CCC OER email list. And with that, back to you, Una. 
All right. Thank you so much, James. And um, I want to just let uh, everybody uh, Thank everyone for coming today. Um, it was such a pleasure, of course, to hear Dr. Harris, but the, the conversations in the chat were also really exciting. Um, if, yeah, uh, Robert, it looks like you have a question. A uh, very quick question about the showcases. Are they uh, going to be open for us to uh, pick which date we would like to showcase or how would that work? Thank you, Robert. <laughs> You're a couple steps ahead of us. Uh, we, we know this is a super busy time. We'll be reaching out in the next week or so and giving people a calendar and um, letting them choose which date works best for them. So thank you. Okay, sounds good. And, and really, the only thing I would add to what James has said is that, um, you know, some folks had some very, um, you know, um, impressive action plans. And so we also want to hear what you want to do in the future as well. And um, what you've what you've been able to do this spring and you know what your experiences have been that kind of thing with your students, but also what what might be coming up next. So and did we have any other questions? Otherwise, I want to um, encourage you to take our um, our survey here. Um, and Liz, if, if possible, if you could put that in the chat window. Um, and uh, this is just to give us feedback. Um, we've asked you to do that after most of the webinars. Um, and it's also uh, an opportunity for you to give us suggestions for other speakers that might be for upcoming webinars. So- um, Oh, and Una, this is James, one more time. One final note for our OFAR participants. You received a, an email and a notice yesterday in the course uh, about a whole host of uh, evaluation activities coming up here. So please, uh, do take a look at that email and help us document the tremendous impact that you're having. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your Friday afternoon and a wonderful weekend. And uh, we'll see you next month, um, if not before. So take care. Absolutely.